Welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us today as we worship and get in God's Word. Um, if you're new with us, we're just so glad that you've tuned in. My name is Matt Gurton. I am the pastor of Local Church. Local Church is a new church. It's called a church plant, or sometimes we call it a baby church. We're just starting out. We're part of the Sojourn Network of Churches, um, and you can learn more about that on our website. Uh, but we gathered for the first time publicly on March 8th uh, at Dover Intermediate School in Westlake. And then that week, as you know, uh, the COVID-19 crisis hit, and so we had to shut down, and we've been adapting like everybody else in every other church, and meeting online, and, and doing Zoom calls, and things like that. So if you're newer to local church, we're so glad uh, that the Lord has led you to be a uh, part of us right now, and I know it's a little bit awkward. If you have any questions or anything at all, feel free to reach out at any time. Email me. Um, but we are excited that some of you have already begun meeting together in each other's homes. That began last week, and I've heard some really cool stories this week of how you connected, and you're already reaching out to neighbors. And so I just want to encourage you, if you're at a place right now, uh, individually or as a family, where you're comfortable with beginning to meet maybe with another family or two or an individual or two, uh, we want to encourage that. And, and if there's somebody in the church you want to reach out to, go ahead and make those connections. If maybe you don't know um, other people or don't know who might live near you or in your own community, uh, feel free to contact me and we will get you connected to somebody else. Uh, there are homes that have offered to open up and to welcome other people into worship. And so we'd love to see that happen. So uh, keep going in, in, in those things and connecting as much as you can with others. Uh, one of our core values is, is care and hospitality. And so we want to continue building those relationships with one another. Um, I just want to let you know, too, we're still on track to hopefully... Uh, begin corporately gathering as a church sometime in mid to late July. Uh, I told you a few weeks ago that there's another church in the area that has uh, agreed to let us use some of their space uh, on a Sunday when, it, when they're not meeting. And so as they're getting up and running and getting back into meeting themselves, we're going to be a few weeks behind them. So we will give you more details, but I just want to let you know that that is coming. We, we can't wait to get back together. And so we're working toward uh, that aim. But um, as we get into our study in Ephesians again today, this is week two as, we've, as we're going through the book of Ephesians, um, we've had a great week here at our house. Uh, some of you know some good friends of ours from Kentucky. Their last name is Rock, so the Rocks have been here uh, for this week, and we've had so much fun. Dave and I went to Bible college together many, many years ago. We were roommates all the way through, and this, just in the Lord's love and grace to us, we've remained friends uh, we've both gotten married, and then we became friends as, as couples, and then we started having kids, and a lot of kids. Uh, they have four, we have five, and so over the years, we've just remained friends, and now our kids are friends, and so they've spent the week with us, and we've just had a blast, but I got to tell you, uh, we have played just about every game uh, known to man. Uh, we've done basketball and badminton and football and can jam and capture the flag in a game called Koob, which is an old Viking game. We've played tag and volleyball and board games and just games, games, games. And so it's been great. The weather's cooperated with that. Uh, you got to get nine kids out of the house. Um, but what's the first thing you got to do? If you want to play a big group game, what's like the first thing you got to do? You got to pick up teams, right? And so you probably grew up at school and on the playground, like you get people together, you want to play a quick game of basketball, you got to pick up teams. And so usually how this goes is you pick two people, uh, whoever the organizers are, they're, they're the team captains, and then they take turns picking their team. Now, this is a incredibly uh, anxiety-causing time for some people getting picked because you don't want to be picked last. And oftentimes, the people picked first are the more athletic or the bigger and the stronger or the faster. Um, growing up, I really didn't have the problem of being, picking la being picked last, uh, at least not till a little later. Um, I came out of the womb basically this size. I think I was 6'1 at the age of 13. And so whenever we'd play a pickup game of anything, people would look at me and be like, I want Matt. Uh, he's huge. Um, and then they would soon discover that the joke was on them. I had grown so fast as a kid that my coordination didn't catch up with my height. And so I was dismal at many sports. Um, and I'm still waiting for that coordination to catch up with my growth. And it hasn't happened yet. Um, 
But I think we'd all agree that it feels really good to be picked, right? You want to be picked first. You want to be picked early at least. And it just feels good. You're like, you're, you feel validated. Like, okay, I'm valuable to somebody. I'm going to be on their team. They want me on their team. But sometimes if you were the team captain, you wouldn't always pick who you thought would be the best. Sometimes you had another motivation. Sometimes you wanted to pick your friends. You wanted your friend on your team or a family member. And so um, that the, the, the relationship trumped maybe the, the skill level involved. Relationship was more important than winning. And that's a great thing. Or maybe there was somebody you just didn't want them to feel bad. And so you were moved, maybe even as a kid with compassion, and you chose them for your team. That is awesome. And then sometimes you'd be playing with kids and you had no idea their skill level. And so you just randomly picked and you got people on your team. Continuing with the picking thing. Another thing that came to mind is something called fantasy football. I'm sure this is less relatable to many of you, but some of you know what I'm talking about. Uh, Fantasy football, fantasy baseball is where typically, generally, a bunch of guys get together before a sports season starts and you have a draft where you try to pick uh, players, we'll say from the NFL, you pick Uh, the best players that you can get from different teams in the NFL to be part of your team. And then week to week, depending on how those individual individual players do, your team scores a bunch of points. And so you're trying to pick uh, the best players available against all these other guys. And you go in draft format and you you each take your turn. And so um, typically you want the best person available in a position. But what often happens, I do it and almost everybody I've ever done fantasy football with does it, that somewhere in the draft you stop picking the best player available to you and you pick somebody that you really like or you pick someone from your favorite NFL team and you just want them on their team regardless of their skill level. Oftentimes they're terrible, but you just want to have that person on your team. And what that is called is a heart pick, is that your heart, your affinity for your favorite team or for that individual uh, helps you, makes you throw out all other considerations about how they may help or may not help your team, and you just want that person on your team. I grew up loving the Washington Redskins. I still do. And so every year that I played fantasy football, I had at least one Redskins player on my team. And I can tell you, it didn't serve me well. The Redskins may be worse than the Browns. Maybe. Um, So a hard pick has nothing to do with the player's ability, but everything to do with your affection for that person. And so believe it or not, I'm saying all of this stuff about picking because where we go in Ephesians chapter 1 today talks about God choosing those who would be his. And so uh, I want to pray first as we jump in. So do that with me. Lord, um, thank you for another week, another opportunity to come together virtually to get into your word. I pray for those that are gathered with other uh, individuals this morning. Uh, Lord, that you would just encourage their time, that they would be blessed by their interaction with one another. I pray that they would um, listen and, and just really care for each other well, that they would pray for one another before they leave today. For those that are still meeting just in their home or, or with their family, we thank you that the same Holy Spirit that is with us when we're all together is the same Holy Spirit that lives in us and is with us when we have to be apart. And so, Lord, we look forward to the time when we can be together. But, Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit would guide us now as Paul prays that you would open our understanding, Lord, that we would understand what it is that you are revealing to us in your word today. May we love you more. May we, may we praise you more as a result. In Jesus' name, amen. As we looked at uh, Ephesians chapter 1 last week, we saw in the very first verse that Paul says, hey, I am an apostle by the will of God. That he didn't choose to be an apostle, it was God who chose him. And then we looked at Acts 9, where God says of Paul that he is a chosen instrument of mine. And then we turn to Galatians chapter 1, where Paul himself says that he was set apart by God before he was even born. So Paul has already been poking at this, this idea that God chooses us even before we're born. He says, I want you to be part of my team. And so that's going to play out and flesh out a little bit more where we go today. Um, So verses 1 and 2 is all we got through last week. And it's basically Paul's greeting as he writes this letter to this church in the city of Ephesus. Um, He he does the greeting. And then as you get to verse 3, 
it's like, bam, he goes right into praise. And from verse 3 to verse 14 in our English Bibles, in the original Greek, it is one huge, long, run-on sentence. Paul loved long, run-on sentences. And so this is one example of it where he just praises the Lord just effusely, it just comes out of him for these many, many verses from 3 to 14. And so today we're just going to take from verse 3 to verse 6. And so go ahead and turn there with me, Ephesians chapter 1, beginning at verse 3. Um, I'm going to read through the whole thing, and then we're going to go back through and make a couple observations. But Paul says this, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. Uh, he's just getting started. Like I said, he goes to verse 14 with that enthusiasm, that energy, that amount of praise and worship to the Lord for the truth that he is recounting here. And so uh, why? Why is he so excited? Why is he praising? Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing. Why is he so excited? Because of what God has done for us in Christ. You see that there in verse 3. If you, as, you, as we go through the whole book, the whole letter of Ephesians, it's six chapters, uh, that phrase or similar phrasing of in Christ shows up at approximately 40 times. That what we have as believers is because of what God has done through Christ by His Spirit is that we have been made one in in Christ, we are in Him, and we're going to develop that later in the in the series. Um, but because believers are now in Christ, because of His death and resurrection, He has made us one with Him. That every spiritual blessing is ours in the heavenly places. That doesn't just mean in heaven, but in the heavenly places. Again, we're going to get into this later in Ephesians, but uh, Paul will talk about how the spiritual realm is real. It is more real than the physical realm, that there are for forces of good and evil, of God and his power and his angels, and demonic forces in Satan and his kingdom. All of that is real and is happening. Um, but what Paul is saying is he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in Christ in the heavenly realms that it is a done deal. We are in Christ. Everything that Christ has is available to us in the heavenly realms. We're going to get into that more later. But then Paul gets into, well, how are we in Christ? How do we get that, those blessings? Like, how, are we, how is it possible that we are even in Christ? And before we look at verse 4, one commentary I read this week said this. It says, here, as we get into this passage, here we confront the mystery of divine election, which the New Testament consistently proclaims, not as a conundrum to tease our minds, but as a wonder to evoke our praise. And so Paul goes on for all these verses in praise because it's being evoked by the truths that we're going to see right now. So verse 4 why or how are we in Christ? Verse 4, even as he, meaning God the Father, even as he chose us in him, meaning Jesus, before the foundation of the world. God chose us. God chose us. He picked us for his team. When, when, when he saw how big or strong or fast we were, how, how good of a Christian we're going to be. No, he chose us before we even showed up at the gym. He chose us before we even moved into the neighborhood. He chose us before we were born. He chose us before he created anything. He just told us that he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Remember in Galatians 1, Paul recognizes, he says, before I was born, you chose me. If you go all the way to the back of the Bible, Revelation chapter 13 and Revelation chapter 17 talk about the book of life. And the book of life represents or is the place where all of the names of those who belong to Jesus, those who will be allowed to enter into heaven for eternity, if your name's not in there, you don't get in. 
But in both those chapters, chapter 13 and chapter 17, it says that the names written in there were written in there, quote, before the foundation of the world. Revelation was written by the Apostle John, where we are today, Ephesians was written by the Apostle Paul. They both use the same language. Before the foundation of the world, God chose. He wrote down in his book. He knew those who would be his, those he was choosing to be his. And so he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. It doesn't say he chose us because we would be holy and blameless. It says that he chose us that so that we would be holy and blameless before him. We weren't the tallest. We weren't the most athletic. We weren't the most godly. That is not why God chose us. He chose us, as we're going to see, because of his mercy and grace. Um, one author writes this, Wayne Grudem, he's a theologian. He writes, election, election is, a, is another word for God choosing us. In the New Testament, you often see the word the elect, referring to believers, to Christians, to those who belong to Christ. So he says, election is an act of God before creation in which he chooses some people to be saved, not on account of any foreseen merit in them, but only because of his sovereign good pleasure. So if God didn't choose me because of something he saw that I would do or some good I would be or that I'd be some huge asset to his team, um, then why did he pick me then? Why did he pick you? Why did he pick any believers throughout history to be his own? Verse five, Paul tells us, he, God, predestined us for adoption. I'm sorry, I got a little ahead of myself. In love, he predestined us. Why did he choose us? Why did he pick us? Because of love. God's motivation was love. John 3, 16, for God so what? So love the world that he gave his only son. He, gave, he sent Jesus to die for us because of love. He so loved the world. That was his motivation. It was God's heart pick, referring back to the fantasy football thing. God's motivation for choosing us wasn't because of anything we brought to the table. It wasn't because of any of our faithfulness or ability or desire. All of that had to come from him. In love, he predestined us predestined means pre-planned or foreordained or predetermined to choose in advance it was god's blueprint his design his plan he mapped it all out from eternity past before the foundations of the world he chose us he wrote his name and his, our names in the book of life and so this whole idea of of in love god choosing us is not just a paul thing it's not just a New Testament thing. It is throughout Scripture. And so uh, one huge passage which really says it well is Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 6 through 8. And where we are in the story here is Moses is addressing the Israelites, the people of Israel, after God has just led them out of slavery in Egypt. They were in slavery in Egypt for 400 years. God brings them out miraculously. And so Moses is reminding them, in chapter 7, verse 6, he says, For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. Holy means set apart. Unlike others, God made you holy. He set you apart. He chose you. You are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession. I love that phrase that we are his treasured possession. Out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth... Now get this, it was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you. In other words, you weren't the strongest kid on the block. You couldn't throw the dodgeball the fastest. That's not why he chose you. Uh, it was not because you were more in number than all the people, any other people on the earth that the Lord set his love on you and chose you. For you actually were the fewest of all peoples. Then finally, verse 8. But it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. 
Moses is reminding the people, like, don't get it twisted. God didn't choose you because you were great and you were amazing and he would be lucky to have you on his team. You were actually the weakest. God chose you because of his love for you. In love, he predestined us. And then you get, that's the story of the whole New Testament. Many of us have been reading through the Bible this year together and you've commented to me, you've seen it like, man, God's people get it wrong every time and he's the one that has to come in and save the day. It's because he is faithful. He has chosen us. He has bound himself to us in covenant and saying, you're mine, you're mine. I'm gonna bring you back. I have chosen you. Then you get to the New Testament and you get Jesus, especially in John. And so in John, Jesus... John 5, 21, 6, verse 37, 39, and, and 44. Jesus references this, that we, he has chosen us, the Father's chosen us. Those who the Father has chosen will come to him. John 15, 16, Jesus says, you did not choose me, but I chose you. And then you get to Acts. And as the apostles are preaching the gospel, and they're preaching the gospel to Jews and Gentiles, Luke writes in Acts 13, 48, he says, as many as were ordained to eternal life, believed. So as they're preaching to crowds, those who were ordained or chosen or picked or pre-planned, those who were ordained to eternal life, believed. It wasn't those who believed were ordained to eternal life. It's those who God chose as they heard the gospel message, they were then able to believe. God chose them. Then you get to Romans, and Romans is huge, and I'm not going to read them, but I want to give you these references. So as you're wrestling with this, as maybe some of this is new to you that God shows you, I want to give you these references so you can go look it up on your own. Romans chapter 8, verses 28 through 30, huge. Romans chapter 9, verses 6 through 29. Paul there is addressing the different questions that rise up, like how is that fair? How could God choose some and not others? Romans 11, verses 5, 7, and 28. And then you get into the rest of the New Testament. Colossians 3.12 refers to believers as God's chosen ones. 1 Thessalonians 1.4, he has chosen you. 2 Thessalonians 2.13, God chose you as the first fruits to be saved. And then Titus 1.1, 1, 1, 1 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, 1 Peter 2.9. And then I already told you about Revelation. God, throughout his word, is telling us over and over and over again, I chose you. Because of my love for you, because of my plan, I chose you. Not by works, not because of anything that you've done, so you get no credit for it. My motivation, the reason I chose you, is because of my love for you. And so you're like, why did you list all of those things, Matt? It's because we need to hear it. Just like it feels really good to be picked and to know that somebody, that team captain for dodgeball picked you and wants you on his team. How much uh, more important is it to know that the God, the creator, the sustainer of the universe chose you to be his own? And he reaffirms it all throughout his word saying, I want you to be mine because of his great love for us we need to hear it we need to be reminded of it okay go back to verse five in love he predestined us predestined us for what for adoption as sons through jesus christ he predestined us for adoption so no not only did he predestine us for salvation like okay we get uh to be in heaven now for eternity with him not only that he says i predestined you for adoption i want you to be my sons and my daughters i want you to be part of my family and this was not lost on the people of ephesus remember ephesus was a province of the roman empire at the time roman empire was huge and sprawling and in roman law and practice someone could adopt a child even if they were a slave you could adopt a, even a slave and make them your own child legally and legally, that child or individual would receive the full rights, status, privileges, and inheritance of the family as though they were your own biological child. They got it all through the act of adoption. And so this is on purpose that, that Paul uses this language because it would click with the people of the day like, dude, that's a big deal. 
And sometimes that would happen that these high ranking Roman officials maybe wouldn't have sons and they had nobody to carry on the family name. So they would adopt even slaves and say, hey, will you be part of my family? And you would get all of the privilege as if you were born into that house yourself. God is saying, I chose you to be part of my family. Romans 8, 17, Paul says, we are joint heirs with Jesus. It's crazy, right? That we get to be brothers and sisters with Jesus Christ, the creator of the universe, because of what God has done for us, because he has chosen us. So do you begin to see why Paul is so excited and and, and just overflows with praise to the Lord because of what God has done for us? Okay, the end of verse 5. Predestined us for adoption of sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. What's that mean? According to his blueprint, to his plan. He chose all according to how he foreordained things to go. And so the, the more we get the undeserved love and grace that God has poured out onto us, the more that it will spring up praise and worship out of our hearts. We can't help but say, thank you, Jesus. I don't deserve this kind of love. God, you are amazing. And so today, in this short time, we have seen um, how God has chosen us and adopted us. And then next week, we're going to see how that was made possible because we've been redeemed by the Son of God, by Jesus and his death and resurrection, we've, we've been purchased back. Our sin has been paid for. Sin and Satan and death has, no longer has a hold on us. It has been accomplished. The adoption process has been accomplished through the sacrifice of Jesus. And we're also going to see how we've then been sealed by the Holy Spirit, that his spirit has been placed within us as proof and evidence of the fact that we belong to him, that we are part of his family. 1 John 3, 1 says this, It says, see what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called the children of God. And that is what we are like. Can you believe how amazing God's love is that he would make us his own kids? He would make us children of God. And so maybe you're like, okay, well, what does this mean? How how does this have a whole lot of bearing on life. Well, it has absolute huge impact and implications on life, especially um, with where we are in our culture today. The last few weeks have just been devastating on so many levels. We weep with those who weep. Uh, There is lots of destruction and anger. There's a lot of foolishness right now. There are a lot of foolish decisions being made by people on on every side. There aren't just two sides here. Sadly, The oppression of our black brothers and sisters in our nation is being overshadowed by many of these other things that are just lawlessness and and hate. And so, church, we got to keep praying. We got to keep praying. We need to repent of the things that the Lord's bringing up in our own hearts. I've already shared with you the Lord's been bringing up stuff in my own heart, my own pride, my own fear. Um, and, And we need to weep with those who weep. We need to stand up for what is true. Um... And so as we look at God's gospel blueprint, the way that he has designed us, the way that his love moved toward us and chose us, not because of anything we brought to the table. In fact, the Bible tells us over and over again that we were God's enemies because we were born into sin. We hated God. We were born with a nature that was opposed to him. And yet God demonstrated his love for us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That kind of love is unbelievable. And how different would our culture look right now if we were motivated and and living out of and making decisions and speaking out of and and listening in ways that demonstrated that kind of love for our cultural issues, for the issues in our home, for the issues in our marriages as we relate to our kids. If we had that kind of love that understood that I am no better than you, I am no more deserving of God's love and mercy and 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 patience with me than you or anybody else, that I am just as wicked in my heart apart from the grace of God as anybody else. You see, the more we begin to understand how undeserving we are of the grace that has been poured out on us, the more we realize, like, how could I not love somebody else when this type of love has been given 
to me. I don't deserve God's love more than anyone else. I need God's love just as desperately as anybody else. And so as we continue to journey together, as we continue to seek the Lord, as we continue to ask for wisdom and how we engage our culture right now, how we engage one another, we need this type of love. We need to be reminded of the grace and the love that the Lord has poured into us, that he chose us, not because of anything we brought to the table. If anything, we were a liability to him. But he loves taking the weak, the broken, the foolish things of the world to shame the wise because he gets the glory. And so that's the last part. Verse 6. He chose us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of of his will to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved And so next week, we're going to talk more about being in the beloved, being in Jesus, what he has done for us so that we can be one with him for eternity. So I invite you now just to pray with me. Just take a moment to uh, calm your heart. If there's something uh, from the word today, something that was said that just caught your attention, um, maybe you find yourself just being... um, full of just gratitude like lord thank you that you chose me just express that to him you can do it out loud right now or just even in your own heart and let's just be real if there's something in your heart or in your head right now where you're offended you're like i don't know what to think of this i've never heard about it like this before uh god chooses some and not others how does that even work if there's something in that Would you just take that question to the Lord or that offense or that whatever is kind of tough to swallow? We'd say, Lord, would you help me understand? Would you help me, Lord, to dig into your word? Would you help me by your spirit to guide me in the truth? Jesus, I thank you for your word to us. I thank you for the consistency throughout Scripture that you were faithful, that you chose us, that you set us apart from before you even created anything, Lord. You said, I want you. I want you as an individual. I want you as my people to be my body, my bride, my inheritance. Part of my family, adopted sons and daughters. Lord, we thank you for the ways that you are building local church, for the ways that you're bringing us together, Lord. Uh, continue, Lord, to fill us with your love, to clothe us with humility. Lord, the way we conduct ourselves with one another, the way that we talk about one another in the community, the way that we engage with other believers and unbelievers online and social media, the things that we post, the comments that we write, Lord. May you stop us by your spirit and, and may what we communicate and the motivation and why and how we're communicating May those things be just clothed in this kind of love, the love that is just um, just completely humble before you, that we are no better than anybody else. Jesus, would you continue to draw others to you because of the love that is being displayed through us, through your church. We love you, Lord. We're excited to see what you have for us as we go week by week in this series. In Jesus' name we ask these things. Amen. Thanks for being with us today. Thanks for jumping in the Word. If you haven't done it yet, I want to encourage you to read through the entire book of Ephesians. It'll take you about 15, 20 minutes. It'll just help give you a, a, a kind of a bird's eye view of where we'll be going over the next several weeks. And I also want to remind you that on Wednesdays, we gather for prayer, uh, for live prayer on Facebook and our local church group page. If you haven't joined that yet, go ahead and, and click the link at the bottom of the email. And uh, we'd love to pray with you. Uh, as always, if you have any needs, financial, we have, we have a sharing fund set aside for money to uh, address the needs of our community. Uh, if you are in any kind of financial need, shoot me an email and we will uh, see what we can do. Um, if you need prayer, encouragement, anything at all, we'd love to hear from you. We love you. We're praying for you. And we can't wait till we can worship together again in person. God bless.